darkness I lingered mid doubt and despair since bondage long held me a captive to care but Jesus delivered my soul from its chains his precious blood cleansed me from sin's guilty stains the world and its pleasures tempt me to stray. I saw not the danger that lurked on the way. The toils closed around me. I knew no release, but Jesus has found me and given me his peace. Get right with God, his pardon. Jesus is calling, oh, come unto me. Take him, O sinner, and get right with God. Hello, hello. Welcome to my channel if you're new. All right. Well, I'm going to share a topic that's probably worth understanding and not an easy subject to share, but I thought this would be uh, pertinent in this time that we're living in, in these last days. And my appeal is simple. The best person to follow in terms of balance is Christ and Christ alone. And I want to bring to our attention some, some things that I personally have seen but also I've seen dangers in both sides so I hope that this brief appeal will shed some light not only to your heart but mine as well so I'd like to start us off with let me first address to our dear conservative Adventists there's a text here in Isaiah 65 verse 1 to 7 I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way which was not good, after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face that sacrifices in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves, and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh, and broth of abominable things is in their vessels, which say, Stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, which have burnt incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work onto their bosom. So these are pretty strong strong statements here first um, let us address in the earlier part of the chapter here in verse 2 God says clearly that he spread out his hands to a rebellious people so he's addressing to a people who think they're better or holier than those who may not appear as holy in the eyes of man but yet God says in verse 2 he is spread out his hands on all day Onto a rebellious people. So guess what? Rebellion is not just those who may uh, have an appearance of, you know, not doing what God is asking them to do. This is rebellion too. But this also God refers to as rebellious people. Because it says here, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. So 
When a people seeks to go after their own thoughts, they walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. This, in the eyes of God, is rebellious, is rebellion. Now, if you think of, for example, Lucifer, back in, in heaven, before he was kicked out of heaven, he was rebellious because he thought himself to be higher than God. And we see this in scripture, uh, in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. Because of his beauty, he fell. And he convinced a third of the angels that God was not a right God and he claims to be better than God. So this is rebellion in the eyes of God. That's pretty clear. Let me share another Bible verse before I share my thoughts, actually. Um, let us also go to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye, which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest also thou also be tempted. Thou also be tempted. And so, when we may appear, or when one appears to be spiritual, if we truly are converted, and we don't have the spirit of rebellion, those who are more spiritually grounded because of the relationship with God, when they truly are converted, they will seek to restore those who are weaker in the faith, in meekness, considering ourselves, lest we be tempted. So what does that mean? That simply means meekness. What is meekness? Gentleness. And that's actually one of the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, 23, talks about the fruits of the Spirit in more detail. But... Uh, my dear friends, my dear conservative Adventists, um, how often do we hear, I mean, I'm talking about the overly, overly, you know, extreme, fanatical, conservative Adventists out there who are not restoring those who are weaker in the faith or may appear to be not as solid in the Lord as you may be, um, do not restore in the meekness and gentleness as Christ did. And I think we need to be careful with that because many a times people could turn away. Have you ever heard often, you know, especially I've met so many Adventists, um, for example, who are born in the faith, most likely super liberal uh, for the most part, because perhaps maybe their parents were super rigid with them perhaps weren't gentle enough or god knows i'm not judging but god knows and you always hear stories that these were born in this in the faith they're born in the Adventist message but they're super super liberal in their views and so forth and so um we should our hearts should go out you know and not judge whether someone is super conservative or super liberal i've noticed a pattern too with those who are super super duper conservative um they were in the world and then they came into the church and they don't want nothing to do with any part of the world and they're either super fanatical <laughs> or extreme and that scares people away too and it's not gentle not gentle so to my super conservative friends i admire you i admire the fact that you're seeking to do what is right i believe you love god okay we're not judging that we're not disputing that but I think there's fair balance when we do it Christ's method alone, his way. And if we study in the Gospels how Christ did it, how he restored, he was hard on the Pharisees who knew better. I pray that this appeal is an eye-opening for you uh, to prayerfully consider yourself, look at your heart, look deep within your heart, search your own heart, try and ask God to try your heart and repent from this rebellion. Because it is rebellion according to scriptures. Now, to my liberal Adventists, very liberal Adventists, I have a, a message for you too as well. And I pray that as you, as you hear this, that you don't sense that I'm judging. Because we often hear those who are very liberal, you're judging me. And especially uh, if we're pointing out something that scripture um, clearly condemns or clearly makes clear indications that this is not the way to to go um, i would like to share first corinthians chapter 10 
verses 31. Now, just remind, I just want to remind us all, I was not born in the message. I was not born in the Adventist message. In fact, I was in the world, hardcore in the world, and not religious at all. But when I came into the faith, I was super, super duper, I would say. I would say a little too much extreme over the board. I didn't have balance. But with time, you know, uh, Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about, you know, we put away childish things. When you became a man, we put away childish things. Just like a baby. When you're new, when you're a baby, you know, you do things that may be unreasonable, not balanced. But as you grow, you become more mature. Uh, things are thoroughly thought through before doing or we think before we speak. There are scriptures that support that in terms of... Um, it says in Ecclesiastics, a fool is known by his many words. Uh, so there's a time to speak, a time not to speak. Uh, but i like to share importantly in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, we probably know this verse. It says here, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Now, why I'm sharing this verse? We often read this verse, but obviously in this context, um, Paul was talking about in verse from verse 23 onwards, you're encouraged to read the whole chapter. Um, he says, all things are not lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but not, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Verse 25, whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Now, often we hear liberals say, oh, well, you know, Jesus ate fish, or, you know, it's okay to do this, or we keep anything, and they attack those who are appear fanatical or extreme. They attack those who are seeking to do what is right in the eyes of God. Just like how it's wrong for those who are extra extreme, conservative side, who attack the liberals, Adventists, saying on oh, their rebellion, or their, they are, they're compromising and so forth, and putting them down, we believe both parties, both sides, they have a love for God. We believe, we're not judging hearts here. But there's also danger when we take a verse, a Bible, and say, well, you know, grace, grace, grace. God loves us. He accepts us who we are. He meets us where we are. And Jesus' blood covers us. But it also says in verse 28, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 28, But if any man say unto you, this is offered and sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showeth it and for conscious sake for the earth is the lord and the fullness thereof verse 29 conscience i say not thine own but of the other for why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience so yes everyone has god has given everyone the freedom of choice but it is dangerous when we do things to cause a stumbling block to another person who may be weaker in the faith who's just understanding god and learning that's where the danger lies so uh, I get it, you know, uh, where I met a lot of Adventist liberals uh, who try to match, like, the world and everything that they do, uh, they say or think or whatever habits or practices in order to win people into the church. And this approach not only is not the most effective, but it cheapens the gospel because uh, God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And, you know, God meets us where we are, but he, doesn't, he didn't die on the cross for us to stay where we are. When we're exposed and we know better, we do better, and we are judged according to the light that we know. And I just want to share another verse here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. It says... My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Now before I even continue, what is sin? Sin is a transgression of God's commandments, His laws. We know that God's laws are His character. And so when, when we willfully sin, we're willfully, you know, consciously doing that, knowing we know better, and we, we, the Ten Commandments is so deep, it's, it's incredible. Just a simple example. Thou shalt not bear false witness. We're bearing false witness when we are exposed to what God requires us to do. 
but we choose what we think we esteem is okay and God accepts it and we continue doing this and then we are hurting the conscience of others who may be watching you and are confused. I, coming from the world, I will be confused if I see, for example, someone who is a bearer of the three angels' messages, but yet um, could live any old how, could eat any old how, could dress any old how. And these are things that come with time, but through Christ. When Christ is abiding in the heart, those things will come naturally, of course. But uh, this can affect someone who is learning and growing, right? So we've got to be mindful of that too. But in verse 1, it says, My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. So Jesus Christ, the righteous. So yes, if we fall, we do have an advocate with the Father. That doesn't mean we willfully deliberately sin I say okay we'll deliberately we can do this we'll do whatever but we have an advocate with the father no it's not what the text that's not what the text says okay if any man sin we have an advocate with the father okay this is not deliberate sin it's it's not intentional okay just like how we don't intentionally cheat on our spouse or we don't intentionally steal from someone right um it's the same thing for with god and verse two and he is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Now, we're not saying here that we can keep commandments in our own strength. No, of course not. We can't. We can never do that, actually. Because our flesh, the Bible says that our flesh is an enmity with the Spirit. So we cannot do anything in our own power. But with the help of Christ, by yielding to Christ, we can. Verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. How did Christ walk? He walked in total obedience. Okay. He did not compromise with his followers. He mingled with them, but the scripture never records him compromising. He stood to the scriptures. He obeyed God rather than man. And by mingling and caring about their welfare without condemning those who don't know better, notice he will rebuke those who knew better. But to those who don't know better, the Gentiles, he would say, he mingled and sought their good. He sought their affairs that they needed. But Christ came to save not only uh, the lost and in, in the lost sheep of Israel who are in the fold, but even those of the world. But he was very balanced in doing so. And so in verse um, 7, Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. What is the gospel? What is the good news? It's to share what Christ did on Calvary for us. This is the gospel, right? Let me just read here for the context sake um, before I share my appeal here. <laughs> okay, um, Galatians 2 verse 20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, but let me actually read verse 19 to be on. Let me go from verse 19. It says, For I thought the law, I'm dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we hear two extremes. I've met Adventists who say, you, you know, we we uh, we keep sinning until Christ comes. We can never have victory over sin on this earth. And then I hear another extreme where we say, we can never, never sin. I met really extremes where I, I met a person that even said to me, oh, I don't sin. And... 
I have a problem with that because the fact, the very fact that one says that is actually evidence that you just, you just sinned by just saying that because pride precedes fall. And when we don't acknowledge our nothingness and our dependence on Christ, it's only through Christ we could have victory over sin. So we can't just loosely say that we could, yes, with our efforts combined with the Spirit of God and yielding to Him daily, this is sanctification of a lifetime, it takes time. But things that you used to do, you don't do anymore, right? It's, it's a process, it's a process. But if we choose to follow Christ, my friends, the safest way is to follow Christ's example. Look in the gospel, see what Christ did. That's your only safeguard. Because if I follow ministers, if I follow people, I, I can get lost in between. But our truest safeguard is following Christ and his example and how, how he did it. He's the mastermind and genius on how to truly win souls. Um, now, it's one thing to win souls and get numbers and stuff like this. This is great. But it's only in heaven we'll, we'll truly discover the fruits. And even this earth, we may see fruits. But sometimes we may not even, just just in this lifetime, we may not even see that. Sometimes because some may be prideful, say, hey, look how much souls I won. Or just for God's glory, he prefers not to, to disclose that here on earth. He will reserve that for heaven. Who knows? But in the end of the day, my appeal, and I want to address all angles here because there's a lot of to topics that deal with extreme views. And even Ellen White, she mentions about avoiding uh, extremes, right? Balance is key. Balance is key. Um, when we think of, this is a good one, we often hear judgments of an Adventist who is wealthy and tie that with, you know, <laughs> uh, they're probably not their loss or they love money. There's nothing wrong of being an Adventist or a Christian for that matter who is God is blessed with wealth or finances. The key is what are they doing with this wealth and are they have a love for this money or are they using for God's glory? That's one. Another thing I hear often loose judgments on both sides is on the question of social status. If an Adventist is divorced, let's say, it is often loose statements, oh, um, they're often looked down upon, they're, looked, they're often looked down on as well, and they're judged when we don't know what happened, what took place, and why they got to where they got to, all right? And then those who are married, let's say, they think they're holier or better because marriage is holy, it's an institution, and I bless and I thank God for all well-ordered families, uh, in fact, it's a glory to, and it's a testimony to the world. So we need to see more of that. So I'm for that, 110%. But unfortunately, there are those who think they're holier than those who may not have a perfect family life or they're not to where they're supposed to be. And they tend to idolize their marriage or idolize their spouse and, and have an attitude of holier-than-thou attitude. They may not say it, but their behavior testifies of that. And God could easily allow things to happen where the spouse passes away or things can happen, acts, terrible accident, God forbid. But the key is uh, we should not be prideful whatever God has blessed us with, whether it's country living. And I want to talk, talk about this too. There are those who are super conservative Adventists uh, on, on the subject of, subject of country living where those who are in the country are holier or more righteous than those who are living in the cities. This is wrong too. God did not call us <laughs> to have this attitude. In fact, God could easily allow things to happen where locusts and things could mess up your crops or your house could be destroyed by a terrible disaster. And then there's your there goes your home. And God could use God's people in the city. There are some who are called to tarry in the city, in fact, to do God's work. So... We have to be really, really careful and balanced in our thinking and praying. And the only way we could be balanced is through scriptures, by reading the word of God, spending time with Christ and watching how he does things. Uh, we could see how it can line up with our crooked way of thinking. And the list just goes, goes on and on. I could talk forever about so many topics that can hurt many people. 
uh, if we're not careful in our approach. Uh, we do get me wrong. We are called to be watchmen. We are called to call sin by its right name. Uh, we are called to warn if there's a uh, danger lies ahead. Yes, we ought to do that. That's love, not just mercy, grace, mercy, grace, lovey, dovey messages. No, there's a time for, you know, straight testimony. There's a time for that. But we have to do it lovingly and Christ's method alone. We just can't go wrong with that. And uh, so I hope this sheds some light. <laughs> I'm not perfect. I'm still growing. I'm still learning. But I pray nonetheless that this video finds you hope and comfort to my dear super conservative Adventists and even Christians around the world. You have fanatics in all religions, whether it's Muslim, whether it's Buddhism or whatever. You have the liberals, uh, Judaism, liberal, Muslim, whatever the case. When people see when you're super duper radical, it could turn people away and turn people off. And that's, that's their view of God when you do that. And that's any religion, okay? Same thing when you're super liberal. You're giving a picture to their view of God as well. So the safest bet is to follow Christ's example. His way is balanced. His approach was balanced. And he was very successful at winning souls. But not just that. It's not about numbers. It's about quality, discipleship. Christ was not interested in the numbers. In fact, he was interested in the quality. Will your disciples or will the people after that follow you through Christ, of course, are they are they bearing fruit? You see, I've heard, I've seen, I've seen Christians, whether it's Adventists or whatever, they leave the church because the pressure that they got when they came in was a distorted view of the gospel. And I've met super duper fanatics for the, one of the coldest individuals I've ever met and encountered. They left and went aside as well. So our safest bet is to stay anchored in Christ, stay balanced, and pray for me as well as I'm, as we all pray for one another. Hope this message finds you comfort and not condemnation. And let me show you this last text actually to comfort us here. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. And as I, before I read this last verse, just want to share, you know, it's not a boxing match between liberals and conservatives. I find that a lot in Christianism and perhaps maybe other denominations too, but it's not a, it's like a boxing match, you know, like, oh, the conservatives are, oh, you know, they're crooked thinking, be careful, watch them. Or the conservatives to liberals, oh, watch them, they're apostates or they're this or that. Again, we got to meet people where they are. Pray. Now, it's one thing to know better and then you still choose to be rebellious. That's a different story. But to those who don't know better, whether you're super extreme in the fanatical conservative side or whether you're super duper liberal, that, any, that any, just anything goes, may you find comfort and hope in this verse. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Okay, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So, the end of the day, it's very clear. We often use just the first part of the verse. <laughs> There's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. But we forget the latter part which says, Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Let's not forget that. We must not walk after our own ideologies, our flesh, whether you're extremely fanatical and conservative side, whether you're super duper liberal on that side. In the eyes of God, you're both considered as rebellious. We're so considered rebellious when we're both sides of the extreme. So let us be safe side and just abide in Christ where there's true balance. Uh, we cannot be more precious or present truth than he is, than Christ alone. And... Um, I hope you find comfort in this message. May God bless you. If you're new to this channel, uh, you are more than welcome uh, to just subscribe to this channel. If you are already in this channel and this message uh, does not suit you well and it's offensive to you and you are subscribed to my channel, I will not be offended if you unsubscribe to my channel as well. 
I'm not here to please men, but to please God. All right. So may God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And until next time, bye for now. Take him, O sinner.